Hello and welcome. Could social media radically reshape the political landscape of the Middle East? It's a question that many in the region are asking following Tunisia's popular uprising and departure of the country's longtime president, Zin al Abidin Ben Ali. Now, many are pointing to the power of Twitter and Facebook, saying that the social networks helped to mobilize protesters and shone the spotlight of international media attention on the situation there. Tunisia's revolution came as a surprise because the country had almost no real organized opposition and the government had near total control over information. Activists outside the country argued that this display of people power could be the beginning of a larger move towards political reform in the Arab world. On today's show, we examine the Tunisia effect, what it will mean for neighboring countries, and is it possible to tweet a revolution? Remember, you can join our conversation with your questions and comments. You can send an SMS or an email, and we'll gladly take your phone calls on the show as well. Joining me from Doha is Sami bin Garbia, co-founder of the Tunisian website Nawat.org, which played a critical role in getting information out of the country during the uprising. He's also advocacy director at Global Voices Online. From Cairo, we have Wael Abbas, an Egyptian activist who regularly breaks stories about corruption and police brutality on his blog, Misr Digital. And with us from Boston is Mauritanian-American Nasr Wadadi, an outreach director at the Islamic, American Islamic Congress, where he promotes civil rights and social media activism in the Arab world. Gentlemen, I welcome you all to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Well, uh, Sami Ben Garbia, I want to start with you and ask about that situation there uh, in Tunisia. And some believe it's an irreversible change. Uh, do you believe that to be the case, or is it likely that the usual suspects will res resurface, considering that many of those now in control are essentially those who are in uh, Ben Ali's uh, government, even though they've distanced themselves from the party? Is this a, a real irreversible change that's taken place in your country? Uh, yes, I do think it is uh, an irreversible change uh, in the way that the demands that uh, are being scanned and chanted by um, the activists on the ground are really uh, clear. They are demanding the dissolution of the ruling party, the RCD. They are demanding that the symbols and the, the, the old guard of Ben Ali's regime that n are now sitting and having the Kirol uh, in the government, in the so-called unity government, they are demanding that they quit this government and to have another government that will represent more the people that will have uh, in it uh, leaders of banned uh, political parties, right. leaders of the unionists, leaders of the students, etc. So uh, I think the Tunisian people have break the fear, the obstacle of the fear, and has managed it strategically to um, collaborate uh, between um, activists on the ground, activists online, and to uh, build um, a collective uh, support from within the Arab world. Mm -hmm. We've seen activists from Mauritania to Iraq supporting the Tunisian case. They have been translating, they have been uh, contacting new uh, mainstream media in order to get the attention to the well, Sammy, uh, what's going on on the ground in Tunisia. Yeah, yes. Sami, let me ask you, you fled Tunisia um, uh, some years ago and you won political asylum in Europe. And, and I wonder what opportunity is there for you to return and how different do you expect things to be back there? Um, I'm planning to go back the next week, hopefully. Uh, and um, I, I, I'm not sure, I mean, about the situation. I was disconnected from the Tunisian reality for uh, uh, 13 years now, but I am on a daily basis following what's going on in Tunisia. We are offering platform to publish uh, political uh, stuff, so we know what's going on in Tunisia. We have a real touch about the struggle of human rights advocates, of political advocates on the ground. Uh, we have a strong uh, connection with, uh, with the bloggers, with the cyber activists, and with the on-the-ground activists. We, so we are following on mm -hmm. a daily basis what's going on in the country, but as real uh, touch with, with, with the reality, mm -hmm. I, I lost that for the last 13 years, so okay. I need to see and, and judge. Yeah. All right, well, I've got more questions for you in a second, but let me bring in Nasser Wadadi here. And, and Nasser, I wondered, you know, was this really a revolution using uh, social media such as Twitter and Facebook? I mean, could, could this have happened without Twitter and uh, Facebook? Uh, the short answer is no, and the context really is that uh, this revolution happened really because the Tunisian people uh, showed courage and hero heroism going down to the streets and making their demands heard. But Twitter and Facebook 
operated actually as a, a huge vacuum, like basically echo chamber that tra relayed information coming out of Tunisia to the outside world. Uh, it's not. It's too early to measure how much of that information was uh, going back into Tunisia. But the main effect that the uh, uh, many experts and as, as some one of the people who actually uh, followed this from the very beginning and uh, took a role in it, uh, the, the, the emphasis really was getting the word out, what is going on, and getting uh, international media to uh, focus on that. And just for mm -hmm. the record, it was uh, your own network that was first gave major coverage to this. Right. And we know that because many of the uh, uh, your correspondents joined on Twitter. I know that because I follow them and they follow me. Right. And that's when they started paying attention. But remember that the international, like uh, Western media, mainstream media organizations didn't pay attention to what was going on in Tunisia, not only for the last 23 years, but during the first weeks of the, uh, the two, okay. first two weeks of the uprising. Mm and they uh, they didn't pay attention until anonymous started defacing um, defacing uh, the the government uh, Tunisian government's websites okay well now I wonder what was it that prevented the authorities in Tunisia from from stopping that flow of information I mean considering the government's had an iron grip on flow of information in the in the more traditional media sense actually they tried they the the, the in the beginning they were going very aggressively I mean Noat, which was run by our friend Sami bin Rabia uh, they were go like on a cat and mouse game, trying to uh, shut them down. And they were actually, because Facebook was the de facto biggest platform that Tunisians use inside Tunisia, they started censoring uh, censoring any profiles, user profiles that had any information the government didn't want. And furthermore, they were phishing and doing massive har harvesting of passwords and uh, usernames and hacking into activists' uh, activists' uh, uh, right. accounts and trying to shut them down. By the way, uh, Sammy here, who's with us on the show, uh, uh, tweeted it and reported on it. He had his uh, pa uh, account hacked, the, his Gmail account. Right. And he is a professional who kno has years of experience and had massive security deployed, and yet there was a security breach. That tells you how aggressive the Tunisian government was uh, going after this and trying to quell it. They had the biggest filter in the world, but the irony is that they they were unable to prevent information from going out okay. from uh, Tunisia to the world. Nasser, uh, uh, before I get uh, to, to Weil as well, let me get, Nasser, to you. A couple of quick questions we had on a similar theme from uh, viewers, two of them back to back. One from Tunisia, which came from Reem mm -hmm. uh, Trabelsi, who says, protests are likely to occur in other Arab countries, particularly if governments fail to implement reforms. People, want, uh, mm. people who want to change will be willing to brave the chaos of revolution. The second email comes from Malaysia, uh, from uh, Sarah Fahrenheit, who says, Arab leaders have continually misled their people and shifted blame. Tunisians have shown the Arab world that it is possible to end the injustice and tyranny of their dictators. Let me ask you just briefly, Nasser, do you think this idea, mm -hmm. this concept of, you know, a uh, social media revolution is going to start affecting other Arab countries? No, what will start affecting Arab countries is the real demands of the people on the ground because the governments have been failing consistently in delivering what people want, which is, by the way, it's not a matter of bread and dollars and cents. It's, it's very much freedom, freedom of speech, free democracy is at the heart of the matter. And uh, social media, again, uh, has a role of uh, uh, cross-pollination of expertise of activists who have experience and people who have been on the like training activists and spreading this culture it has also the power of letting the outside world know that m major events are happening and by the way Algerians Moroccans Egyptians and people as far as Iraq and Oman are watching very closely using social media. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate decision, as Ch Tunisia shows, is that it took Mohammed Bouazizi to set her, burn himself alive for the Tunisian people to rise. That's what, what makes a revolution happen, not so okay. much social media. And we're, we're seeing that happening more. I want to bring in Wael Abbas. Good to uh, speak with you again, Wael. Uh, I want to get an email to you that came from a viewer in uh, New you. York, in the USA, uh, from Billy Rizzo, who wrote in saying, the Tunisian uprising will have a domino effect across the Arab world, just like Eastern Europe under communist rule in 1989. But I, I think, I gather you don't really see a replication of this kind of uh, uh, revolution, if you like, uh, from Tunisia uh, being exported to anywhere else in the Middle East in the same way, do you? Well, I, I, th I think it can happen in uh, lots of Arab countries, but only if the uh, opposition there organizes itself and stop stops being fragmented as it is, as is the case here in Egypt. Uh, the problem with Egypt is that it's 
a bit unlikely that something similar happens to here because we don't have workers syndic strong uh, syndicates for workers and unions uh, just like the lawyers syndicate in Tunisia and the syndicate of uh, doctors and the syndicate of people who are working in education. Uh, our government is smart. It, this regime has been in power for like 60 years, uh, a military rule, and it has been able to cope with uh, the changes that that are happening in the world, even the fall of the Soviet Union, it was even able to predict the fall of the Soviet Union and change its allies. Uh, we have moved from being a socialist country to an open door policy country to a, a new liberal country. Uh, and uh, this shows that our government is smart and knows how to deal with the opposition. And it's working on fragmenting the opposition more and more and also the people are not well educated as the case with Tunisia. In Tunisia, the illiteracy rate is very low. But everything can happen. Everything can happen. I, I'm not denying that uh, uh, something like what happened in Tunisia can happen in Egypt. Uh, but uh, people need to be more aware. People need to feel involved. People need to connect between the problems that they are facing in their daily life and the, the existing regime. Also, uh, the, the what happened in Tunisia has sent a good, a very good uh, sign. Uh, even to me, I have begun, I've start, started to lose hope that a change is going to happen to our regime since it's an ally of the United States and it's uh, supported by Europe and France and Germany and Italy and the, such countries. But a dictator like Ben Ali has been removed by his own people, although he was supported by the U.S. and he was supported by mm. France. And this sends a very good, okay. positive sign to the rest of the world. Well, the let's Arab get, world. Thank you. Uh, let's get in a call from Maryland. Uh, Nadia, thank you very much for your patience. What would you like to ask? Well, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to oh, make a comment. Um, first of all, um, I just want to say how proud I am of my people back home. But I also want to say that although um, the social media didn't didn't um, create or cause the events. They did help. For me, for instance, here in Maryland, I was able to, through Twitter, follow all that was happening um, in real time. Right. Um, news, media, internationally and nationally didn't report anything, and that was my only way to get the information. All right, Nadia, thank you. Uh, let me just bring in Mohammed from London, who's also on the phone. Uh, Mohammed, what would you like to add to the uh, debate? Mr. Mohammed Iqbal calling you. A leopard doesn't change his skin. I love the question I want to ask you. Mm -hmm. This is a resolution. You don't have the same people who was involved with the last president. And you know, Martin Luther King said, we all have a duty to change and transform neighborhoods into brotherhoods. Brothers, the people who are political asylum seekers were left outside the uh, outside Tunisia. It's your time to go back and uh, to, to educate right. people in Tunisia. You can run the country, and you have not sort all the battles been fought against you. You stood by. Okay. Uh, people have died and Mohammed, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask uh, Sami Mugabe about this because uh, it, um, Bile had mentioned and uh, I think Nasser had mentioned actually sorry about your your website being hacked and I wonder uh, how easy it was for you to get that information in and out I mean I wonder how were you able to work and how the people in Tunisia were able to access what you were doing how easily they could get it well <clears throat> first of all let's remind that the Tunisian anti-censorship movement is a a decade old movement it has built its own uh, anti-censorship strategy and it has also built its own um, dissemination of the information strategy for the last 10 years uh, the Tunisian government although was very su uh, su successful in, 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 in preventing people from within the country to, to access this information but in the meantime they managed to create a new generation an entire youth who is really skilled in using circumvention technology to bypass the filter right. and get access to the banned information so that that's what the big irony that that played during the last month but the last month is a product i mean if we are only talking about the social media effect uh, i still believe that the real actor are the people on the ground are the people the courage the bravery and the blood of our uh, beloved tunisian people who made this happen the social media played as 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 a key a key role in way of bridging the gap between people on the ground who are taking risk taking footage uploading them on their uh, facebook account and then you have another team who are accurating that information we've seen tens of 
Facebook pages uh, like um, uh, uh, we call it Anba al Tunisi or the the um, uh, the Tunisian street uh, news yeah. agency who was I mean accurating the information correcting the date correcting the place and you have people who are taking that information and taking it out of Facebook and putting that on a dedicated blogs and website and translating the information putting the information into context and making that ready for mainstream media to pick the story up and that's right. what Al Jazeera was uh, doing that's what France Badkat do, was doing so you have uh, uh, multiple nodes of activists online that each of those nodes are doing its own uh, strategy. Right. You have people who are translating, you have people who are putting stories in context, and you have people who are trying to build hubs with the mainstream media and pushing them to write about Tunisia. Okay. And that's what, when we reach it, what, what we call the, the information cascade. And that information cascade helped to convince the the Tunisian people to go into the street right. and another uh, uh, I think important action I, I, I would love to add is that the Tunisian uh, government the state-run television uh, TV set on the, the day of Sunday the 9th they 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 started talking about the the, the, the Tunisian who have been killed during the demonstration right. and that the t that was the turning point the Sammy? next Monday people went to the street okay I'm yes. going to touch more on this in a second but let me let me get a caller in who's been waiting also Ahmed has been waiting from Washington DC to join the conversation go ahead Ahmed yeah I'm just um, asking uh, now there was a from Mauritania I'm from the same country we had a change actually in Mauritania we were all happy about it but um, uh, military took over and things start changing. Um, do you think that Tunisia uh, will get to the right track that we all dream about, or are we going to get back uh, to the same chaos that we have now in Mauritania? Nasser Wadadi, I should put that to you really because yeah. you have the Monetar Mauritanian roots as well. Well, uh, it's my home country, and, mm -hmm. I, and I'll answer the question by saying that uh, uh, that's precisely why it is very important, and the Tunisians have already managed to do that, is hold RCD accountable and prevent them at any cost from uh, recycling themselves and claiming they have changed. Ultimately, our democratic experience and more short-lived democratic experience in Mauritania was uh, was aborted because of the military's interference. And I, I might add, and a lot of people will not like this back home, but because of the lack of organization and skill of the political class, because they allowed the symbols of corruption. Remember this. These are the people who were for 25 years were pillaged Mauritania. They would basically, their allegiance was on sale. And General Mohammed Abdul Abdelaziz, the, head, the current head of state, who arrived in allegedly uh, democratic elections? We know all. Uh, all uh, we know all, all. What that means? Uh, basically, uh, co-opted them, and uh, they were willing to. Uh, they were willing to uh, uh, sell the country's future to, uh, to at the highest bidder, and that's why it is very important now for the Tunisian people to never uh, forgive, never forget. But in the words of Munsaf al Marzuki, this no no blood should uh, should be shed in this, and it's very important to hold these people accountable. There needs to be not only a transitional government, but there needs to be a mechanism uh, for uh, conflict resolution and uh, uh, and, and the African and the South African model. Because remember, uh, up to a hundred people, a hundred Tunisian citizens, innocent citizens, were killed in the last month. Somebody has to pay accounts for right. that, and you cannot build a healthy democracy without uh, holding the likes of Kemal Morjan, who's now in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the the, mini the Minister okay. of the Interior, who who, gave, who ordered the shootings, is still Minister of the Interior. That's right. outrageous, and I'm happy to see that the Tunisian people are demanding holding them accountable. It's great they imploded the RCD, which okay. is what we failed to do in Mauritania. Well, while uh, while Abbas, uh, let me uh, get uh, this this uh, comment from the Secretary General of the Arab League, Amr Musa. Uh, who linked the protests in Tunisia to the economic troubles uh, faced by ordinary people in the Arab world. Now, speaking of the Arab League summit um, at uh, Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, here's what he had to say. The Tunisian revolution is not far from us and not far from the main topic of this summit, which is about social and economic development in our countries. That is what is going on in our minds now, that the Arab soul is broken by poverty, unemployment, and general recession. Now, while it sounded like some kind of warning to Arab leaders uh, given here at the uh, the Arab League summit, to to say, look, there is there is a uh, change in the air. But do you think the leadership is listening around the Arab world? 
Well, I think they are listening carefully and they also are trying to take action. Uh, there was this piece of news on Al Jazeera saying that Egypt has cancelled all uh, plans to raise taxes and raise prices and stuff like that, that the, our government had to deny what was on Al Jazeera to look cool and look that it, it, it's not touched but what happened in Tunisia. But it was obvious the next day that Ben Ali left uh, Tunisia, the, all the headlines of the official newspapers, especially Al Akbar, had news like Egypt is doing fine. Our Mubarak's policy are very wise and the country cannot uh, um, uh, suffer something like what happened in Tunisia. So they are listening and they are touched and they are afraid and they will try to uh, sedate their people or to make some reforms to convince the people that things are going for the better. Let me bring in Sami Ben Garbia here again and, and you know, ask you about this, uh, uh, to answer this email we had from a viewer in the USA. Uh, Ali in New York wrote in saying, unlike Iran in 1979 or the Algerian War of the 50s and 60s, there is no leadership mechanism in Tunisia to replace the corrupt government. A more oppressive regime than that of Ben Ali could come into being. Now, I wonder, it's kind of ironic that uh, it's not like it was forced by economic circumstances that much in, in uh, Tunisia, and you were indicating some of the issues that, that helped mobilize people onto the streets. Um, and I wonder, you know, apart from the, the young Mohammed uh, Bouazizi who uh, set himself on fire, there was also the issue of WikiLeaks as well. And I wonder how much impact that had to, for people to actually have, I guess, on paper, some of the stuff that they suspected about the government? Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't think that the issue of unemployment was the main issue. I think the main issue was freedom and dignity, and this is what we've heard uh, from the first day. I mean, the main slogan, the unified slogan that was scanned from Sidi Bouzid to Bizarre to Bingerdan was uh, 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 work uh, freedom and national dignity and the national dignity is the main the main issue uh, for this uh, revolution um, regarding WikiLeaks uh, I don't think that WikiLeaks added a lot of information to what the Tunisian people already knew uh, but it confirmed that that common knowledge about this corrupted uh, system of, of what we call in Tunisia a mafiosi actually this is a mafiosi system um, I don't know it will take time actually to to to, to understand uh, what what is the real level of the impact of the WikiLeaks and, and the, the the funny thing is that we've seen a lot of incident in 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 the mining region of uh, Gafsar Daif we've seen uh, others um, uh, uprising in, in Bingerdan, but both incidents didn't create this catalyst uh, 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 event that gathered the entire society, that gathered the unionists, the lawyer, the, the, the students' movement, the, the, the offline and the online activity. And this is the first time that we witnessed this. The other strength, actually, of this movement that we do not have any kind of leadership. And I don't think this is a weakness. I think this is the strength. It is a very grassroots uh, social movement, both online and, uh, and offline, which made for the government, uh, which made it hard for the government to co-opt it, to hijack it, or even to, to negotiate with those leaders. Because you can right. buy those leaders, but now you cannot buy them. There is no leader to buy. There is no okay. leader to corrupt. Sammy, well, I want to thank you and also uh, Weil and uh, Nasser for uh, joining this debate. We never have enough time, of course. There's always so much to discuss, but Al Jazeera will be following what's happening in Tunisia and, of course, keep you all updated on the debates uh, going throughout the Middle East region on this. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Remember, you can watch a podcast of the show on iTunes. This week, we're featuring a discussion on whether or not U.S. and NATO forces are finally gaining momentum against the Taliban in Afghanistan. On the next show, former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf gives his perspective on dealing with the challenges of religious extremism, political instability, and corruption in his country. Be sure to tune in for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.